My name is Claire Pomeroy. I'm the president of the Albert and Mary Lasker Foundation in New York City. Imagine. Imagine that you're 17 and you've just aged out of the foster care system. You're living alone. You're working a low-paying job that just covers the rent. Imagine the day you get a sore throat and a fever and you start to wheeze. There's no one there to make you chicken soup and no money to pay for Tylenol. So you take the bus, you go to the local ER, and they write you a prescription for antibiotics and an inhaler that you can't afford to fill and quickly discharge you. You walk out alone and scared, really unsure of how you're going to get through the day. And what if your breathing gets worse? Well, as you guessed, I don't need to imagine that because that 17-year-old was me. And that day I learned a lesson that I tried to remember each day as a practicing physician. We don't truly care for our patients until we address all the things that they need to feel better. You know, the doctors and nurses in that ER, they weren't bad clinicians. They just worked in a sick care system that didn't have the resources or the incentives to provide what I really needed, a ride home, some good food, and enough money to make it through the month, even though I was going to miss a bunch of days of work. So I'm here to advocate that we need to change our reimbursement system so that clinicians receive risk-adjusted payments adequate to ensure that patients receive all those wraparound services that they need. And to do that, we need to do two things. First, risk-adjust payments so that they correlate with the cost of needed services. That means higher payments for the neediest communities and the neediest patients. And second, we have to make sure that those higher risk-adjusted payments are actually used to provide those extra services. Only then, I believe, will we achieve our shared goal of health equity. We know that social determinants of health, the conditions into which we are born, the conditions in which we live and work and play and age, are much more powerful drivers of health than traditional clinical services. In fact, we know that what we do in the hospital and clinic accounts for only about 10% of the health of a population. And other factors, such as race, socioeconomic status, education, job security, housing, transportation, access to food, the chance to live in a safe neighborhood, and the sense of social support, social cohesiveness, these are much more powerful drivers of health. We know that vulnerable populations have worse outcomes. We know that African Americans die on average four years younger than whites, and that this difference is exacerbated by education such that white men with greater than 16 years of education live 14 years longer than black men with less than a high school education. We know that income correlates with life expectancy. In this recent JAMA article, we see a direct relationship over the entire range of incomes to life expectancy, such that there is greater than one decade difference in life expectancy among the highest earners and the lowest earners. And we understand that populations with deleterious social determinants are more costly to care for. As shown here in red, you see the age and sex adjusted expected costs for health care by income quintile. And in blue, you see the actual costs, such that in the lowest quintile, the actual costs are much higher 
than the expected costs. And in the highest quintile, the expected costs, in fact, are higher than the actual costs. And these realities have a perverse impact of incentivizing some providers too often to cherry pick and avoid caring for those with high risk social determinants. And the tragic consequence is that providers leave poor neighborhoods. And there are disproportionate closures of hospitals in inner cities, further exacerbating health disparities. So my message today is that healthcare cannot be about simple equality, but rather must be about equity. These three boys all want to see over the fence to see the baseball game. And if we give each one of them a box, that's fair, that's equal. But that short guy, and I care about short people, that short guy still can't see the game. But if we think about equity, and we don't give any boxes to that tall kid, and we take his box and we give it to the short kid, then what happens? They can all see the baseball game. Health equity is about giving each person what he or she needs to achieve the goal of health. So we know that paying to address social determinants is effective, very cost effective. We know that early childhood interventions like the Carolina Project, which gave a very low cost play stimulation and free meals from age zero to five, resulted in markedly decreased cardiovascular disease as adults at age 30 with savings to the healthcare system. We know that providing housing to the homeless, such as in the 10th Decile Project or the Bud Clark Commons, that that housing support leads directly to decreased hospital admissions and decreased healthcare costs. Or we know that giving food like Meals on Wheels to the elderly results in things like for every $25 increase in meals delivered to the vulnerable elderly, there's a 1% decline in nursing home admissions. We know that it's cost effective to address the social determinants of health. But despite this, many say, we just don't have the money. I disagree. We spend enough, just not in the right way. We pay downstream, not upstream on social determinants. And so if you look at the United States in red here, you see exactly what was alluded to earlier, that in light blue, which is the health care costs, and in dark blue, which are the social service costs, in the light blue, the United States pays twice as much as every other developed country, 16% of GDP. But our spending on social services is much lower, so that the total of healthcare spending plus social spending in the United States is quite average. We pay downstream after people get sick instead of paying upstream to prevent them from getting sick in the first place. We spend an affordable amount, we just spend it in the wrong way. So how should we adjust provider payments so that social determinants are addressed? We need to reach across silos of clinical care and social services. We need to work together and bring the educators and the urban planners and the criminal justice experts together. We need to reach across non-traditional partners, reach out to the community as true partners. We need to bring government and philanthropy and academia uh, together to come up with these solutions. And such intersectoral cooperation will require policy changes, common agendas across the service providers, linked data and information sharing systems, aligned budgets, and linked evaluation metrics. We know that neighborhood is a powerful driver of health, and so we need to adjust payments so that those caring for the most vulnerable, i.e. those with the greatest social determinants needs, receive higher risk adjusted payments by community and ultimately by individual. We should adjust payments so that those working in needy neighborhoods, taking care of those with high social determinants needs, receive the dollars they need to address those social determinant needs. We're making some progress. They're great examples. We've heard some today. CMS, the State Innovation Models Initiative, 
uh, they actually released some guidelines that allow Medicaid support of housing for the homeless. The Accountable Health Communities model is an exciting five-year pilot which asks if social assistance can improve health and reduce costs. They are providing $157 million to a maximum of 44 bridge organizations. They don't have to be traditional healthcare organizations to address housing and food access and transportation, i.e. the social determinants of health and see what the impact on healthcare costs is. But I would submit to you that these are one-off demonstration projects and we need to fundamentally adjust payments to allow those to care uh, who care for the vulnerable to address social determinants. And that brings me to my essential second point. We must ensure that those higher risk-adjusted payments are actually used to provide this full suite of services. They cannot go to the institutional bottom line. They can't be used to increase provider salaries. They can't be rewards or draws to work in undesirable neighborhoods. Indeed, if we fail to ensure that they're used for the services, risk-adjusted payments could have some very deleterious impacts. And as some who have resisted community-adjusted payments have said, we could validate lower standards of care. We could reward poor quality and per actually perpetuate health disparities. But if we do make sure that those risk-adjusted payments go to address the social determinants, the needs of those patients, we can compensate providers for the higher cost of care, of taking care of the vulnerable. We can ensure financial viability of safety net providers. And we can provide the resources that are needed to deliver essential social services. There's a lot of work to be done. It's being discussed at this conference. We need to refine our approach to gathering information on socio-demographic factors and our methodologies for adjusting payment. We need more research on the benefits and risks of adjusted payments and which policy changes are needed. And we need workforce planning so people can work under this new system. But we need to move now. If we do, we could actually start to address social determinants. We could truly move the needle on health in this country. We could advance our goal of health equity. And we could even help ensure that no young person walks out of an ER feeling that no one cares how she'll get through until the wheezing stops. Thank you.